working as a free press operator, but then discovered that that's not exactly what she wanted to do. And now she works for ESCO, and she is an application engineer and, will, and travels around and teaches uh, printers how to use the software and how to automate the process of preparing designs. So I'll give it up for Hannah. Hi, guys. Um, so my name is Hannah, as she said. Uh, I am an application engineer. Uh, it's just a fancy way of saying that I train people how to automate their processes. Um, so I travel around and help printers and pre-press departments um, automate as much of their process as possible. Um, so that's something that when I was in your shoes, uh, I had no idea that automation was even an option. I didn't think about that as a, a career that I could go into. Um, I ended up sort of falling into it. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about what I do, um, kind of where I came from, how I got here, um, and then how, how cool this stuff is that I do to try to entice some of you guys to get into it as well. Um, so a lot of the things that I learned here in GRC helped me a ton for the job that I have now. Um, I think that a lot of you guys have the same skills that it would take to, to get to where I am. Um, so there's proof that I did in fact graduate from Cal Poly. Um, I graduated in 2017. I was a transfer student. Do we have any transfer students in the room? Yeah, we're a rare breed. There's not very many of us. Um, so I only got to stay here for about two years. Uh, I spent some time at Questatch figuring out what I wanted to do, um, and then eventually made myself uh, made my way over here to, to GRC. Um, I chose design reproduction technology just because I thought I wanted to be a designer, um, and the classes were a lot of fun. Uh, but it turns out I probably should have gone for uh, for packaging, right? Uh, I don't know if you remember this, Colleen. When I first uh, got accepted to Cal Poly, I was hanging out in the GRC department just to kind of see. Uh, what, what it looked like and what my new home was going to look like. Um, and I had a conversation with you, and I think you told me about three times that I should be in the uh, packaging concentration. And I thought, oh, no. Uh, good question. Um, I thought, no, I think I want to be a designer. I'm not really interested in packaging. And we parted ways, and maybe like five minutes later, you walked by me again, and you just said in like a sing-songy voice, packaging concentration, as you walked by. So I should have listened. The moral of the story is that Colleen's always right. Yeah, exactly. 20 bucks, right? Perfect. Um, DRT definitely helped me. I feel like I can have conversations with, uh, you know, with designers and understand what, what they're trying to say because I've done a lot of the stuff, well, some of the stuff that they do. Um, so no matter what concentration you pick, I think it can help you in, in any situation. Um, anyway, so I, I went on to work for print and copy while I, uh, while I was at school here. I highly recommend working for print copy or UGS or any printing company in the area if you're interested in going into print because I think it gave me a huge leg up when I was applying for jobs uh, because I already had some experience in print. Pardon me. All right, so I was here for two years. I only had one summer to get an internship. Um, and I decided to get an internship at Pacific Southwest Container. As far as I know, they're going to be at the career fair this Friday, right? Um, and that's where I got my internship. So I went to that career fair with way more resumes than I probably needed. I signed up for a bunch of interviews, and I ended up really hitting it off with their representative, Blake. I don't know if that's who will be here this time. Uh, but it was a really great place to be. If you guys are interested in printing, I recommend going to talk to them because it was an awesome internship. So I spent three months um, you know, cleaning up graphic files, preparing CAD files, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but it was really a, a good <laughs> trial into pre-press. I thought I wanted to do pre-press, but I didn't really know. You don't really know when you're in school what it's actually going to be like. Um, and it was super low risk. It was three months, so if I hated it, I could just never do pre-press again. Uh, but it turned out that I really loved it. And so uh, after I graduated, I went to go work further in pre-press. Um, again, I got this job by interviewing at the GRC Career Fair. You guys should go to the GRC Career Fair if you're not already going. 
Um, it's really the, the way that I got the two things that really propelled me into my career uh, and where I am now. Um, so I worked at, at Sun Chemical in their Flexo pre-press department. It's a lot of uh, corrugated work, a lot of like wine boxes and produce boxes and stuff like that. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, one of the things that I learned at this job, I think that was the most important, is just to volunteer for stuff. So uh, when I started working there, we didn't have anyone that really knew how to color profile or we also had a giant proofer that nobody really know, knew how to use. Um, and so I just volunteered to learn how to use it. And I started spending any of my free time figuring it out. Uh, and it really opened up a lot of doors for me. Uh, I got invited to some trainings and uh, it, it became something else that I could put in my toolbox, you know, something that has helped me even in my current career, uh, just knowing how to profile a press and things like that. So if, if there's anything you see at the jobs that you have that you could potentially try that you're interested in, absolutely volunteer for it. I also volunteered to start working with, uh, with workflows for uh, the ESCO <laughs> software that Sun Chemical had. And that's really where I figured out the automation is what I want to do. So in pre-press, there's a lot of stuff that is just repetitive and it's the same thing over and over again. You know, you're always trapping files and you're always stepping files and you're always cleaning them up in the same way. Um, and I'm kind of lazy. I didn't want to do that every single time. <laughs> so I started spending, uh, you know, an hour or so a day trying to build um, automation into the ESCO software that we have. So it would, I could essentially tell a computer to do that stuff for me. Um, and it saved me a bunch of time and it opened up, again, a couple doors for me. We brought out some ESCO software trainers, which is what I do now, um, to visit us in, at Sun Chemical. <laughs> I got in contact with those people. I realized that they had a job that I really wanted to do. Right? They get to travel around every week and just automate people's systems for them. Take things from taking three hours to taking 30 seconds. You know, it makes a big difference. Um, and so I started talking to people who worked at ESCO. <clears throat> like I said, I've, I had trainers come out to my team. I thought it seemed super sweet what they were doing, so I got their business cards, I started making those connections. Um, also, because I had volunteered to work in ESCO software, I got invited, I was super lucky, I got to go to ESCO World as a customer when I worked for Sun Chemical. So ESCO World is like a giant conference um, specifically for ESCO software. It's like Disneyland for print geeks, it's a lot of fun. There's um, seminars and trainings, and you can play with all the software that they have. Um, and I got to meet a lot of really cool people and make those connections and network with people. Um, you guys are probably going to have a lot of opportunities to go to conferences, even if you haven't been already. Maybe as students you can go, and especially as soon as you become uh, young professionals. I want to advise you guys not to use these conferences to party. You still will, because you're 20-somethings. So of course you will. I did a little bit. Um, but there's a, a little story I have uh, when I was at this, this conference at ESCO World. It was uh, cowboy-themed. And we had a night where it was uh, like a hoedown. So we had barbecue, and there were drinks, and there was line dancing, and there was armadillo racing for some reason. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> so uh, I made friends with a group of people and we did a bunch of line dancing together because you know I had a drink or two and I was feeling feeling fun so we went and did some line dancing uh, spent the whole night with those people and we ended up parting ways uh, I later went to interview for the position that I have now and as soon as I walked into the interview room I recognized one of the faces on the panel uh, that I was interviewing with and it was somebody that I had spent that night line dancing with for a couple hours so luckily I had kept professional and I hadn't made a fool of myself uh, because you never know. So when you're, when you're out of the conference, try not to party too much because you never know when you might be line dancing with your future boss. <laughs> uh, so I interviewed in Dayton, Ohio. That's where ESCO is currently located uh, as far as their headquarters in the U.S. Um, and I also want to advise you guys to be open. So I'm a California native. I didn't really want to leave California because it's the best state, right, obviously. Um, and when I was graduating, I think that a lot of the people I was graduating with, graduating with felt the same, right? So they either wanted to go to San Francisco or LA, and that was it. Like, they were not interested in anywhere else. Um, and I never pictured myself moving to Dayton, Ohio. Uh, but it actually turned out to be a really cool spot. Um, rent was way cheaper, right? Uh, and it's just, 
there are cool places outside of California. So if you find a job that you really think would be interesting, but it's you know in the middle of Nebraska, like give it a shot. It might actually be all right. Uh, so where am I now? Like I said, I spent one year in Dayton, Ohio. I drove a U-Haul with my dad. That's us in a little town in Wyoming, I think, with a population of one. <laughs> uh, so we drove four 10-hour days in a U-Haul with my father across the United States to Dayton, Ohio. It was actually a good time. Um, probably the scariest part of moving out there was just not knowing anyone. Like I was across the United States and I had nobody out there. Um, so I ended up volunteering to try to make friends. I'm there uh, scooping out a horse stall, just volunteering to try to meet people. Farming is a big thing out in Ohio. Um, and then I also met my coworkers. So we went to a little place called Printer's Alley in, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee together. Um, so it was really hard to make friends, but just putting myself out there, getting to know my coworkers, uh, I ended up getting a nice little grouping of people uh, that I could hang out with all the way out there in Ohio. Um, after a year, I was able to move out of Ohio. I kind of had to have a, a trial period with ESCO where I was hanging out in the office. Uh, but now, because I travel so much, they don't really care where I live as long as it's in the United States. So I have the opportunity to move anywhere. Um, and I've got some family up in Buffalo, and so now I am in Buffalo. It's very cold there. Yeah, why Buffalo? I don't know. Good question. <laughs> All right, let's see. So like I said, I am an application engineer. What the heck even is that? Um, my main goal is to be a software trainer. So I teach people how to use our software, mostly pre-pressed software. Um, so it's called uh, taking files through, like graphic files through that process and getting it all ready to print. Um, so I'm teaching customers how to navigate the interface and I'm getting all of their stuff configured, I'm getting it all together. Um, and I'm trying to work with all of the different departments in a printing facility. So graphics and CSRs and the RDOs CAD department, everybody kind of together so that we can take an order from beginning to end with as little user intervention as possible. Um, I also do a lot of workflow building. Basically what a workflow is, it's just like a series of tasks that I can send a file through um, to, to just kind of take some of that work off of our prepress operators. So that monotonous work, I can essentially code a computer to do it for me, um, and I can build those systems for every different customer. Um, I do some of that building, but my main purpose is to train my customers how to do that themselves. And same with troubleshooting. So anytime you're working with computers, you're bound to have a lot of errors. They take things very literally, and so if you don't tell them exactly what to do in the right way, uh, you're going to get a lot of problems. So I have to think on my feet a lot when I'm on site with customers. I have to, if there's an error, figure out what's happening before they get bored or think that I'm failing. Um, so it's a lot of quick trying to figure things out and then also teach them how to do that themselves so that they don't call me all the time after I've gone uh, to try to fix their stuff for them. Uh, so when I talk about automation, um, it's kind of hard to know what that is when you're in school, right? So when I was in school at least, I didn't really understand the process of how a file goes through the entire, you know, from CSRs to printing. Um, so I want to take you guys through a really quick example of how that process works. So you can see all of the different <coughs> places for where we can add efficiency, all of the, the spots where there might be problems um, that automation could fix. Because uh, this is really what I'm trying to do when I go on site. I want to analyze what a customer is doing, figure out how I can make it better. Right. So the first thing that will happen when somebody wants to print a package, for instance, is they're going to call up a, a customer service rep or sales or someone like that. Um, and they're going to say, hey, I want 10,000 boxes, and I kind of want them to look like this, and here's the inks that I want to use. And they give some specs to a customer service rep. And a lot of times when there's no automation, that customer service rep is just like writing down what that person wants. Sometimes they'll type it in, uh, but it's a very manual process, right? They're going to take notes on what that person wants to print. Um, and what they do is they end up printing that stuff out, and they stick it in a physical folder. Uh, a lot of places call it like a job docket or something. Uh, and they, that is now a representation of that job. And so all of the information about that job now sits in this little folder. Um, as soon as they have all of that information, 
they want to send that off to the planning team. So the planning team is going to start scheduling. They want to figure out where and when and what press they want to use to print this thing. They might look back on previous jobs to see if there's something that's similar, like maybe we've already done this before. So they might open up filing cabinets and they're going to start searching through and trying to find some old job that maybe looks like this or maybe we did this exact job before. Um, they want to kind of learn from the mistakes they made before and hopefully not do that again. So again, it's a very manual process searching through stuff, trying to find information. Um, eventually they'll schedule and they'll figure out when they want to print this thing um, and they'll put all of those notes again in this physical job folder um, and then they're going to send that off to Prepress once they've got it all scheduled. So Prepress takes that folder again, eventually it makes its way to their desk. Um, they're going to open up that folder and they're just going to start reading through all of the notes. Right, it's all there's handwritten stuff in there, there's pictures of things with things circled and things crossed out, and there's a lot of complex information going on in this little folder. Uh, it's really easy to lose stuff, it's really easy to miss stuff, especially in pre-press. You know, you might, you've been working on six jobs that day and you might get things mixed up. It's really easy to make a mistake. Uh, but a pre-press operator, they're going to go grab all the stuff that they need. So they're going to call up CAD for the CAD department, they're going to get their die lines, they're going to call the CSR to try to get the art from the customer, they might need fonts, they might need images, they're going to compile everything together. Then they might do trapping, stepping, color correcting, they're going to make sure everything's overprinting correctly, I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with this stuff from the classes you've taken. Um, they're going to spend a whole bunch of time doing all that stuff. Um, and then they are going to communicate with customer or customer service, try to figure out what they need to do. It's a lot of back and forth, right? There's a lot of work going on there, and a lot of it is very repetitive, and uh, it's really easy to miss stuff. Eventually, Prepress is going to make a proof. They're going to send it off to the customer. The customer will sign off, and in that case, it's ready to go to production. Um, so production can take that job folder again, and they're going to read through all the information. They'll make plates, or they'll send it off to a digital press. Uh, they'll print it, and then it'll go through all of its finishing processes, get any varnishes, foils, it'll be cut, it'll be folded, it'll be glued, and eventually shipped off to a customer. So you can see that little job docket, that houses all the information about the job. And if that gets lost, we lose everything, right? And imagine in a print shop, you may have you know, 50 of those little folders traveling around and say, stay on somebody's desk, somebody forgets to move it to the next desk and that job then goes behind because nobody even knew that it was due that day and there's a lot of opportunities there for error. Um, so in automation what I'm trying to do is take that physical job folder and make that digital. So if I can put all of that information in a very organized way, a standardized way, uh, it makes things a lot easier for people to find what they need, not to miss anything. Um, it's also searchable, right? If I see a job and I think, oh this looks familiar but I can't remember uh, when I did this or what it was, I can just search through my past jobs based on customer or based on what that looks like. It makes things a lot easier to find. Um, and once it's in that system, I can tell the computer to look at certain pieces of information and do that stuff for me. So if I'm in prepress and I'm trying to step up my file, maybe it's five across and like ten around, if I'm a prepress person, I have to go look through and find that note and then take the the label and step it across and then step it down. But if I have that information in the software, I can just click a button and it goes and finds the information itself, steps it all for me, and then it's finished And you know, in 30 seconds rather than me spending all that time trying to figure it out myself. So if I can take all that information, put it all together in a clean, standardized way, I can take this whole process, which often takes days, if not weeks, sometimes months, depends on where you are, um, I can really condense that down and solve a lot of timing and efficiency problems as well as quality problems. All right. Okay. So I've told you a little bit about what I do on a really broad level. Right? I take all of this information and put it all together and try to make a computer do all, as much work as I possibly can. Uh, but what do I do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, so most of my time is spent traveling and teaching people how to make everything that I just told you happen, right? So I'm spending, um, usually Monday, I will travel out to a customer anywhere in the United States. 
Uh, and then Tuesday through Friday, I will train them nine to five all day, try to get them up to speed with the software. Uh, and then Friday night, I will usually fly back home. So it's quite a bit of travel. Um, and this is fun. I really like it. Traveling uh, is not for everybody, but I think it's been a lot of fun. Uh, there are some pros, right? I get to see everybody every week. Um, and some of them are really cool. Some of them are in the middle of Idaho, but that's fine. Most of them are okay. Uh, and I get, I get paid, right? I'm, I'm getting paid to sightsee, essentially. I get to go and I will work nine to five, but then after five, if things have gone well, I'm just free to go see the city, see new hiking spots, uh, go to the new brewery down the street, whatever it is. I get to see that city and, and get paid for it. Uh, and travel points, so I travel nearly every week. Um, so if I do decide I want to go on vacation, I can essentially do it for free, which is pretty cool. Um, and I get those updates to first class, and I get to hang out in the Admiral's Lounge. It's, it's good stuff, guys. <laughs> um, but there are cons. So there are a lot of delays. When you're in flights as often as I am, I have slept on a lot of airport floors. <laughs> That's you know, real. Um, especially in winter. I know I moved to Buffalo where it's a lot. But, uh, but yeah, I've, I've slept on a lot of airport floors, and I've missed a lot of things because of delays. But I'm not about it. It gets, it's okay, you kind of get over it. Uh, as long as I don't have anything going on that Friday night or the next Saturday morning or whatever. Um, I don't, also don't have the opportunity to have pets, which is kind of disappointing, um, or plants really even. I'm not really home enough to water my plants. Uh, but I do have a jalapeno plant that's holding on, so <laughs> keep, it, keep it in your thoughts and prayers. <laughs> uh, and then planning. Planning is hard. I can't have like Tuesday night game nights with my friends because I don't know if I'm even going to be in the state at that point, you know. So it can be problematic, but for me it's totally worth it. I think the travel and the different experiences that I've had on the road and just seeing all of the different types of printing facilities has really broadened uh, what I know about print. Um, and it really opens up the doors for me when I decide that I want to go, you know, onto something else. Here's a little map of all the places that I've been in the last year or so with that go. Um, you can see most of it's kind of east coast, because I live on the east coast, so it makes things a little bit easier. Um, but I don't really have a territory. They can send me really just about anywhere. Um, I've got a couple things up in Canada up there. Um, and probably over the next year, I may add 20 to 30 more locations to this map. So I'm really traveling around quite a bit. Um, and then hopefully, if I talk to the right people, I can get over to Europe as well. So travel is everywhere, hopefully global soon. All right, so my primary job is training on site. All right, I travel out to the person that's training. Um, I will kind of watch what they do and try to work automation into what they're already doing as much as possible. So if you go in and you completely change somebody's system, they freak out a little bit, and as soon as you leave, they're never going to touch it again. So you have to kind of work on this delicate balance of changing things, but not changing things too much. Um, and I, it's always custom, right? So if I go on site, every printer does something a little bit different. They're all kind of doing the same basic things, uh, but their configuration is completely different. Their knowledge is different, right? If I, sometimes I get people who can barely use a mouse, and sometimes I get people who are building their own databases. So you never really know what you're going to get into. Uh, and then my primary thing is just to teach. right? So I can build all of this stuff for them and then just leave. But if they can't build it themselves, then I failed. So training is really my main goal. Um, I also do remote sessions. So if I traveled every single week, I would totally lose my mind, and I wouldn't be able to just keep in this job. Um, so usually every I'll travel for about four or five weeks on, and then I will get one week at home. So this gives me time to catch up on like expenses and paperwork. Uh, it also gives me time to study. So there's a lot of stuff. Anytime new software comes out or an update comes out, I need to be able to train it. Um, so I need some time to kind of keep up with that stuff. And a remote session. So a uh, customer will say, we don't want to spend the time and the money to bring you all the way out here. Uh, but why don't we just give you a call and you can look at our screen and kind of walk us through a training that way. Um, so that's pretty nice. I get to just train people in my pajamas on my couch, which is sweet. Highly recommend. Um, so that kind of gives me a break from all of the, the travel and being on planes all the time and being in hotels. 
Um, the last thing that I may do is have classes in uh, our headquarters out in Dayton, so I do still have to go back to Dayton every once in a while. Um, if people don't want to bring me out to them, they can come instead to me, and I will train them advanced automation. Um, it's kind of more of an overview, right? It's not quite as custom as the on uh, but people like that option a lot. So if you guys ever work for a company that has ESCO software um, and you want to have a training, you may come out to Dayton and get trained, and it will be me training you. So say hi if you ever do. All right. So I've talked to you guys a little bit about all of the day-to-day -day stuff, uh, but what about the cool stuff? Uh, I got to go uh, to ESCO World. There's a nice picture of me freaking out because I had to speak in front of large groups of people uh, about things that I kind of knew in front of people who knew everything a lot better than I did. Um, so it was a little bit intimidating, uh, but I made it through. I had three presentations uh, last year in Nashville, Tennessee, and I got invited to go back again this year, so I'm stoked. I guess that means I did an okay job. Um, but I have three more presentations in April, out at ESCO World. So like I said, ESCO World's kind of Disneyland, right? Um, it is just a whole lot of seminars and being able to see all of the cool stuff that other people are doing with our software. So it's a really big learning, uh, learning conference. I also get to see some really cool customers. Um, I don't want to name drop or anything, but there are some really cool customers out there doing some of the state-of-the-art things, right? And they will give me tours of their facility. I get to work directly with some of that equipment. Uh, it's, it's really, really neat. Um, I also get to go to the Bureau of Engraving next week. So on Monday, um, I'm going to be going to where they print money. How cool is that? Mm. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to be spending, I think, three weeks with them, kind of overhauling their entire system and getting them up to date and changing the way that they automate. So that'll be fun. I had to get a background check. I had to do all kinds of stuff. Uh, but yeah, so I'm really stoked about that. And the best part, of course, is travel. I really love it. I think it's worth it. Um, I've been told after a certain amount of time, I'll probably get tired of the travel, uh, but I'm not there yet. Uh, but if I do end up getting tired of the travel, I have options. Um, I have a lot of different options of things that I might be able to do. Uh, team lead, right? So I work on a team of probably about 10 trainers, and we all sort of have our own specialty. So mine, like I said, is automation. Uh, but everybody's got different software that they're sort of in charge of. Um, and we have one person who's in charge of the team to make sure that they have everything that they need and make sure that they're all taken care of. Um, so I do have that sort of pathway that I can go if I want to stay on this team but just manage it. Um, I could also become a project manager. So that's sort of like sales, right? They are taking, uh, they have a couple customers and they want to make sure that that customer has the right software. I want to make sure that that person uh, isn't paying for something that they shouldn't have to and just make sure that they stay upgraded and everything. Um, I could also become a product manager. That's something I'm looking at uh, pretty seriously. It's just a, a person who is in charge of one software. So we've got um, tools that integrate with Illustrator desk pack tools, which you guys may have used here. Um, we've got like Studio that might be something you use. So there's someone who's in charge of that software and they're talking to customers, and they're making sure that they have the features that they want. If there's anything that nobody's using, we can get rid of it. Um, it's kind of making sure that that software stays up to date and that people enjoy using it and have stuff that they need. Um, I could also become something called a solution architect, which also sounds way fancier than it probably is, like application engineer. Uh, but solution architect, they, are, uh, they work with brands more. So like they would work with P&G or with Amazon and they essentially take over their entire automation system. So places that have several different sites, they need someone to kind of make sure that nothing goes wrong, make sure that everything stays updated. Um, and if Amazon wants to implement some new change to the way that, uh, that their automation works, that person is in charge of making that happen. Um, so that's, that's a pretty cool one. And if I really don't want to travel anymore, I can go to remote support and just work from home all the time. So if somebody has uh, if their system blows up or if there's something that's going wrong and they can't figure it out, they'll submit a support case and they'll call me and say, hey, you know, help me fix this thing. And I may spend, you know, a couple hours or a couple days working on their system to try to get them back up to it. So I have a lot of options uh, if and when I decide that the travel is too much for me. But so far, so far so good. All right. a lot 
lot of stuff at GRC that I've used in my current position, or just knowledge that I've learned uh, that's kind of helped me along the way, right? To get the internship that I got in the first place, or to get the job that I had at Chemical, and eventually making my way to where I am now. Um, one of the biggest things I think that's helped me is just understanding print, um, not necessarily super in depth, but just a really good overview of all of the different types of printing um, and how people work. So when I go on site, I'm working with people who have been in the industry for a super long time. Um, and if I can sort of talk shop with them, if I can understand what they're saying and speak their language, it makes things a lot easier for me to relate automation to it. Right? We can kind of use print and the, the knowledge of print to help them understand how to automate it. Um, so that's been the biggest thing, I think, is just knowing how to speak to the people that have been in the industry for a long time. Also file preparation, so stuff like, like I was talking about early trapping and stepping and making sure that things are overprinting correctly. Um, I need to be able to tell a computer, which is very literal, how to do that. Um, and if I don't understand how to do that myself, it's really hard to get a computer to do it for me. Um, so understanding that stuff really in depth has helped me a ton. We also have uh, color management. So that's something that we talked about a little bit when I was here in school. Um, just getting a file from your RGB computer to a CMYK press sometimes can be troublesome. And then there's a lot of stuff that happens in between there as well as far as getting the right color and making sure that everything looks correct. Um, and that's something that I do quite a bit. So just understanding that concept, just some of the basics even, has helped me to learn quite a bit from there. Uh, binding and finishing has helped a lot, just understanding like varnishes and foils. Um, or I've gone to a couple customers that do magazines or books. And so knowing how to impose something uh, helps me to, again, tell a computer how to do that for me so that I don't have to sit there and make a folding dummy every single time. And then consumer packaging. So understanding uh, dye lines and structure and materials and things like that. That's all stuff that I use uh, every single day. I'm mostly working with people who are in the packaging business and printing all kinds of labels and boxes and who knows what else. Um, so that class, I think, has really helped me just, again, to understand what's happening and, and speak the language that the people that I'm working with are speaking. Right. Perfect. So you can too. You have the knowledge from the GRC department to do something similar to what I'm doing. Um, I encourage you to consider it if you're thinking about pre-press uh, as something that you want to do after you graduate. A lot of companies are moving towards automation. The ones that are saving time and they're saving money, they are automating their systems. And this isn't necessarily a sales pitch for ESCO. They are one of the companies that does automation, uh, but there are a bunch out there. Um, so if you're considering going into pre-press, automation uh, can really get your foot in the door and you can go help a, a printing company completely revamp their system and really change the way that things are done. Um, so if you're logical, if you like putting things in a very organized way, if you like uh, you know, computer science, if you like databases, or like coding languages, like I use XML and HTML nearly every day, if that's something that you're interested in, think about going into automation. Um, we definitely need people who understand print as well as understand computer science stuff and can kind of put those together to make automation. Uh, so I absolutely love what I do. Um, I kind of fell into automation uh, on accident. It wasn't really something I was looking for, but it turned out to be something that I, I really love. Um, and I think that the only reason I'm here and the only reason that I've su succeeded as far as I have is just from the classes and the knowledge that I learned uh, while I was here in GRC. Um, that is all. Do we have any questions? Yeah. I don't. Uh, yeah. So there's a couple other companies uh, that do a, a similar thing, right? They all kind of have software that does it just in a different way, and they all have their own trainers and their own their own systems. Yeah. But I just know that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. I do have an apartment that I'm barely in. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, it's not so bad. It's kind of nice having a place that uh, I can like have all my stuff. And then on those remote weeks, I have somewhere to stay. Yeah. Um, but I have considered just like selling my car and selling my house and just traveling around. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, you can kind of go either way. Yeah, it's you but can. Your company pays for you to travel. Yes. Yes. Yeah, they pay for my plane tickets and my hotel and my food and my rental car. They pay for everything. You can actually save a lot of money on that kind of right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Hi. That's okay. Uh, the one that first comes to mind is, uh, I think just because I did it fairly recently, and it was very, uh, it was unorthodox. Uh, usually when I'm training, I'm training maybe like three or four people, um, and they're, again, typically in the pre-press department. Um, I had to train a guy who was completely deaf. Um, so we got a translator, and it's really difficult, I found, to uh, communicate printing concepts through someone who, first of all, doesn't know print. Our translator didn't know print. And then also moving that into sign language, because sign language doesn't really, it's not quite the same as English, right? It's not a one-to-one -one thing. Um, so that was quite a challenge, was just taking, trying to teach this guy. And while he's looking at a computer screen, you can't talk to him because he can't hear you. So it's a lot of back and forth. And it was, uh, it was a challenge. But it, it turned out OK. We took a little bit of extra time to do something. Uh, probably would have taken maybe two days. It took us about four just to spend the time to really make sure that he knew what happened. So he still emails me sometimes, but I know not to call him. <laughs> Email him and stuff. Is that, yes? Okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you use a lot of like um, languages for like coding. Mm -hmm. Did you take, did you like mine or anything at Cal Poly? No. Um, well, I took a couple of classes here that kind of introduced me to like HTML, for instance. Um, but XML is something that I've been using quite a bit, and I just kind of had to learn that myself. And like JavaScript, I use a little bit. It's mostly been self-study. It probably would have helped if I took a class here. <laughs> would have been nice. But yeah, you can always learn it yourself if you need to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was your favorite DSC class? Oh, good question. Uh-oh, they're all right there. Don't do this to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Um, so like I said, I was DRT. Uh, so the, the magazine and the book classes were, were the most fun, I think. Um, I don't necessarily use some of that stuff now, yeah. but making my own book and like making my own magazine, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Anything else? I did. Yeah. I think I used that DRT after all. I remember last year, Hannah, when we were the Phoenix Challenge team, and we were doing a conference call with now, Yeah. Yeah, that was unexpected. It was just training people, and somebody's like, hey, Colleen wants to talk to you. It's like, what? OK. Yeah, that was fun. What's your second favorite? <laughs> <laughs> I would have to say consumer packaging or s strategy. I love that class. That was a good one. Yeah. So, that, so 30 bucks now, I think, is what you owe me. Yeah. <laughs> anyone, anyone else? Yes. From your experience, it's like most of the automation is happening in companies, like it's happening through like an outside source, like yourself, people don't really like do it themselves, or do you even know about that? Uh, that's a good question. Um, my, most of my experience has been with ESCO products, right? Uh, but I think for the, the bigger companies, it's a little bit too much to create yourself, right? Like creating that entire system um, takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and you need people who really know what they're talking about. So a lot of people will go with one of these companies just because they've we've kind of already got it figured out, you know, and that's our whole that's our whole deal is automation. Um, so it can be expensive. Uh, it may be cheaper to do it themselves, but it's it's difficult. Yeah. yeah. Um, what companies have you visited, or like what type of companies have you software? Oh gosh, um, there's a lot of them. Yeah, there's quite a few. I'm trying to think of something I can name. Like I said, Amazon is a big one. Um, I've worked with them quite a bit. Um, I'm trying to think of some other big ones. It's a lot of just little smaller shops that have maybe two or three plants. Um, so 
really anybody that's doing flexo and, and litho or digital printing, a lot of them have it. Yeah, I can't really name too many names, but there's there's quite a few. Yeah. Yeah. What was the? You know how like on your map you had one um, like pin on California? Those here. Oh, that was yeah. yeah, I'm going to go to one place in California, and it's right here. I'm hoping they'll send me out here more. Uh, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Something else? Yeah. Are you planning on going anywhere international? I would like to. Um, so, ESCO itself is headquartered in Ghent, which is in Belgium. Um, so I'm trying to get myself a ticket out there. Uh, but they have their own training team and their own people out there, so it's kind of hard to get myself there when they already, they don't want to pay to send me out there if they've already got somebody there. Um, but I was trying to get to Drupa this year. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a possibility. I just have to make a case for myself to get over there. All right. Yeah. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, we try to 